Are, are you a believer that creative people are born with a creative gift or talent more than, let's say, less creative people? Or can any type of creativity be learned over the years? Yeah. So thank you so much for setting me up for this. Okay. <laughs> number, number one, almost nobody is talented. Talent is completely overrated. I would argue that you were born with certain physical talents that enabled you to excel in sports that I could never have acquired no matter how, how hard I tried. Even that said, though, Larry Bird was not born with the kind of talent that Michael Jordan was. Mm -hmm. Larry Bird just grounded out and shot more practice shots than anybody else. That's a skill. And hustled. Yeah. Yeah. But the good kind of hustle. Yeah, exactly. And, and so it feels to me like talent is a betrayal. It is undermining all of the people who put all that work into skill. Don't call someone skillful talented because they're not. They're skillful. So we can agree that um, playing the piano is a skill in the sense that if you work at it, you get better at it. But I would like to believe that being enthusiastic is a skill. And then so is being creative. It's a skill. You can get better at it. You can choose to put in the work in whatever form it takes. We're not talking about graphic art here unless you want it to be graphic art to gain the skill. And if that's true, that's really good news because it means you're not stuck where you are. It means you can go to where you want to go. And it's really good news because skills can be acquired. Mm -hmm. And that fills me with optimism about so many things in our world. You know, we can point to the human condition and say, people are just doomed to hate each other and to undercut each other. But I can point to a culture where that's not happening. So how did that happen? Well, it's because it's a skill. What are the three biggest skills you think all human beings should acquire, whether it be creativity or some type of attribute that to just make them better human beings, happier, more quote unquote, successful, richer lives yeah. uh, with relationships, health, everything. What are those three skills, whether you're 20 or 60, what three skills should we acquire to live a better life? I love this. Okay. How about this? Number one is uh, the skill of possibility, of seeing that things could be better. Number two, the skill of empathy, practical empathy, of understanding people don't know what you know, don't want what you want, don't see what you see, that they have a noise in your, their head that's different than the noise in your head, and that's okay. And then the third one is uh, the skill of learning how to learn, of being open to saying, I see possibility. I see people who need to be served who aren't who I am. And I, if I put enough into this, can figure out how to make a contribution. Those, I think, are three skills. Mm. I think yeah, it's really just understanding emotional intelligence and people and stepping in other people's shoes and having compassion. Why did you choose those three skills over copywriting or yeah. you know, well, I got, I have personal the finance? Level. There's some, there's yeah, some yeah. next level tactical ones like Decision-making is a skill mm. and almost every Western human is terrible at it. <laughs> Why? Why are we terrible at it? Because sunk costs are something that uh, are probably hardwired into us. What a sunk cost means is the harder you worked to have something, the harder it is for you to give it up. And we see this mistake happen all the time. The, the example I'll give is um, pre covid you've got uh, two tickets to the movies and uh, they were really hard to get and you told your girlfriend that you were gonna go to the movies together. And on your way, you bump into a friend who says, I got two front row seats to see Hamilton, do you wanna go? That means your tickets are worthless. And a lot of people go, well, no, no, there's no well. It doesn't matter how much those tickets cost you. They're sunk, you already made that decision. Mm. You can't unmake it. And so we stick with a job longer than we should, or we stick to a way of thinking about the world longer than we should, because it costs a lot. We went to law school, so now I have to be a lawyer. No, you don't. The law school degree is a gift from your former self. You don't have to take it. You can say, no, thank you, and go do something that gives you joy instead. So sunk costs is a, is a giant skill-based area. 
And then what goes right next to that is the skill of saying, that was a good idea, but I have a better one now. Ooh. And that takes practice. Explain that. So I launched this idea and it started going and I built momentum for a few years, but now this is actually a better idea for the time or for my life or whatever. And so I'm going to let go of that thing and move into this. Well, it's not, that's, that's definitely true. That's some cost, but then beyond it. Okay. I'm the boss and I built this organization and this is how we do our expense reports. But now we're going to do expense reports this way because it's better. Mm. But usually what happens is someone says that problem is solved. I don't have to revisit it. So if I think about the car industry, the car industry said, took us 90 years to develop the internal combustion engine. That was a lot of cycles, a big sunk cost. And someone shows up and says, why don't we make electric cars? And you go, because internal combustion isn't broken. Because I can show you that if we look at an early electric car compared to a state-of-the-art Lexus, the state-of-the-art Lexus is better, not a problem. Whereas what would have transferred billions and billions of dollars of assets away from Elon Musk is if they had said, nope, you're right. We're just going to copy all the things you're doing that are working and make it even better. Because we have an improvement ratchet in place, a dealer network in place. We're trusted. We could go to the races. But senior executives making seven figures said, nope, nothing could be better than this. Mm. Yeah, I tell you what, I got a Tesla a few years ago, and it's hard for me to think I'd ever want to go back for a day-to-day car that's not electric, personally. It just... But let's think about Tesla for a minute because Tesla made a whole bunch of decisions a few years ago that they refused to reconsider, right? That the inside of the car should have no cup holders of a certain kind, that the inside of the car should have these things on the dashboard, but not these things, that the service needs... So they're as guilty of the same thing. They took a leap, they hired a thousand people, and now they're stuck on their sunk costs. Right. That's true. That's true. And they'll be stuck until they innovate or continue to open up. Why, why do we need reassurance? Why, why does it seem like a lot of people need this reassurance just every day? We need some type of reassurance. And why should we avoid reassurance? So that's the second side. Reassurance is futile. Reassurance feels really good, right? It so does, we, get off, it? it's like, we, oh. we get off this call, the phone's ringing, and Kai comes to you and says, hey, Lewis. Great job. It's Oprah. And Oprah was listening. She just wants you to know what a great job you did. Right? Right. So you're, you're, you're fly, flying for like two hours, maybe three. And then you need to hear it from somebody else. Mm. Because what it means to get reassurance is that someone is telling you that the future is going to be okay. And it feels good because we would like the future to be okay. But deep down, we know that that person doesn't know that the future is going to be okay. So as soon as reassurance shows up, it reminds us that we are confronting an uncertain world and we want more of it. We want to be held safely. And it doesn't scale. You can't get enough of it. So what's the alternative? The alternative is to refuse reassurance. So when someone says, you did a great job, Seth, it was amazing. That was the best thing I've ever seen in my entire life. How do we refuse that? Well, that... The answer is thank you. I appreciate you being present and giving me that feedback. But it's reassurance if you then say, and your book launch is going to go great. Because that you can't know. Yeah. Right? That's the second half of, that's what's implied, is that I'm going to tell you about tomorrow. And what's the alternative? The alternative is to say, nobody knows about tomorrow. And looking for external validation that I'm going to catch that fish that that thing I am hoping for is going to work, that other people will get the joke, not only doesn't it help me, it undermines my trust in myself. Mm. It undermines all of the things that I need to merely do the work. So, you know, you've been seduced by, like me and everyone else, with the the just do it thing from Nike. Mm -hmm. And the problem with the word just is that some people think it means what the hell, do whatever you want, doesn't matter, just do it. And I think it should be changed to merely do it. Do it without commentary. Do it without drama. Simply show up and do the thing. Focus on the practice, not hoping and wishing for the outcome that you need to be reassured by, but the practice, the best you can do it. Because if you 
What could be better than the best you could do it? Nothing. So do that, learn from what works, and then do it again. But seeking reassurance is distracting you from doing a better job of what you set out to do in the first place. I saw somewhere, um, I don't know if it was an article or video about Oprah uh, talking about almost 100% of her guests, not everyone, but I think a, a lot of them at the end of the, uh, the, the show would all say the same thing. And I think you know what I'm going to say. It's like, did I do okay? Was that good enough for you? Yeah. But did you like that? And it's this kind of reassurance mindset, right? Of like knowing that we got approval from the person who's interviewing us or working with us or our publisher. Did, were the numbers okay for you? Did the sales go okay? How do we gracefully remove that from our way of being moving forward so that, that we don't have to ask if we did an okay job and we learn to just say, thank you so much for having me or I'm grateful and um, whatever else. Well, like, How should we finish yeah. a project like that? Well, I'm really afraid of the word should. I think should and shame go right next to each other. Mm -hmm. So I will just tell you that there are practices that you can engage in to help you insulate from feedback that isn't going to help. So here's, here's an interesting story. Uh, a bunch of years ago, a, a famous electronics company did a focus group. The way focus groups work is you set up a trailer next to a shopping mall, you pay people some money, they come in for an hour, there's hidden glass windows, and the, the client can watch people touch the product. And they had a clock radio, and it had all these gizmos on it and everything else. And they got eight people in there and they're all looking at the clock radio and they're all talking about how much they love the clock radio. And at the end, the organizer says, thank you so much to thank you for being here. Either you can get the $20 we promised you or the $100 clock radio, which would you prefer? And every single person took the 20 bucks. Why? Because that was the truth. That was the moment that they were actually telling the truth. Oh, so they thought the clock wasn't as worth as much as the $20. Yeah. And so what I have found is I, I have got an ego as much as anybody, maybe more. I like it when the people around me say, you did a really good job. When Oprah mm -hmm. says, that was good, for sure. But I want to see three years later, are people still talking about this idea? Or I just want to see in the afternoon after a blog post, did someone engage with it in a way that changed them when they didn't know that I would notice, right? Because it's not a performance in that moment. It's, did you have an impact? So if you go to Dia Beacon uh, in upstate New York and watch what happens when people walk into a Richard Serra sculpture, which weighs 2 million pounds, I hope Richard has seen that happen because that's, genuine service. He made this. The curator doesn't matter. The dealer doesn't matter. This person had their breath taken away. That's what was mm -hmm. supposed to happen. And it did. And so we play this game with everybody around us. Uh, do I look fat in this dress, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and some of that is totally legitimate. It, it papers over our momentary insecurities and there's nothing wrong with that. But when it comes down to the practice and the art that we seek to make. I think it makes sense to surround ourselves with people who say, I respect you, you're on to something, you can do even better. And for us to start a cycle of what happened when the, this went into the world. Because when it's in the world and people had choices, what did I learn? How can I help a different group of people or this group of people make a different choice. And, you know, in the workshops that I do, I get to watch all of it because I'm like up here and you can see all the interactions. That's different than looking at the test scores because you're watching how people are, ha are, are going back. Yeah. I think I heard our, our good friend, uh, Gary V talking about how, when he started in his dad's uh, wine business, he would yeah. sit there and watch people, walk through the store and say, okay, what if I move this this way? And what if I put this in the front? Did people go and pick it up or do they walk right past it? Observing the results and the exactly. impact that you create on people, whether that's an experiential design or a physical design, whatever it may be. Uh, I'm curious, I'm gonna try to be mindful of the word should. Is it more powerful for creatives to have 
goals and deadlines or is that destructive to the creative process? Right. So uh, deadlines are a weird word because they have the word dead in them. <laughs> Finish lines or launch lines, whatever. Yeah. You like. <laughs> uh, I am super disciplined about deadlines. I have never missed a deadline mm. because I just decided that some people need that tension that comes from being five minutes late. I abhor that. I want to go nowhere near that. So for me, it's fuel. For other people, it might be turbo fuel because they need that five minute over thing. But there are other people who it completely destroys their work. So you got to figure out how do you engage with that? Um, but goals is a different thing. So I was talking to somebody, I wish I could give them credit, who was explaining to me that goals are externally focused. And this is one of the things that led to me writing about it in the book. Meaning, if you say my goal is to be a millionaire, that isn't up to you. It's only partly from you. And the rest of it is luck. And so if you're going to say I'm a good person because I'm lucky and I'm a bad person because I'm unlucky, now you're really in trouble. Instead, what we need are practices that we call our thing, that thing we call our goal is I'm going to be the kind of person that ships this much work each day, that gets out of bed at this time, that manages their expenses so they're always one third of, I mean, you can make a list of things that are completely under your control. Call those your goals and wipe out anything that involves fish, anything that involves something external happening that makes you feel lucky. Mm. So I'm hearing you say focusing more on the, the things you can control daily, the habits, Correct. the practices, the actions, your energy, way of being, your compassion daily as opposed to the end result. Right. And let's get back to where we started, which is the reason people don't do that is because they don't want to hear from their other voice. They don't do that because they don't want to be on the hook. It is easier to catastrophize. It is easier to say I'm distracted. It is easier to say, oh, the world is way too whatever. All of those are external things that let you off the hook. And what I remember is I was born a year and a half before the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? The world is really in trouble in 2020, but the world was 10 minutes away from being gone mm -hmm. in 1962. And so the question is, how did we get from that to Neil Armstrong walking on the moon seven years later? We didn't do it by saying, well, we can't because Russia could end everything in any minute. We said, well, if Russia's gonna end everything in any minute, we might as well send someone to the moon. And my friend, Roz Zander, helped me learn the difference between but and and. So here we go. If you go on a long planned vacation and it's raining, you could say, I'm on vacation, but it's raining. Doesn't that suck? Or you could say, I'm on vacation and it's raining. And the and leaves room for you to say, so I can take a cooking lesson. So I can have some quiet time with my spouse. So I can figure out how to work for social justice. All of those things happened because it's raining. And so, yeah, it's raining right now. It's really bad. And you can do something. Mm -hmm. You can't fix everything, but you can make one person better. Mm -hmm. What are the habits that you believe would support more creatives uh, if they did these habits on a daily basis from your 30 plus years of experience of what's worked for you and what you've seen other people you've studied do? What are those few habits you think could really help them further their inner happiness and hopefully accelerate the luck on the outside as well? Yeah. So we have to not fool ourselves into getting hooked on the external that we'll pretend we're, we're not, but deep down we are. We, and so, yeah. you know, Chung Young Trumpa Rinpoche said, uh, the bad news is we are falling and falling and falling. And the good news is there's nothing to hang on to. And as soon as you acknowledge that there's nothing to hang on to, it gets so much easier to fall. You just let go and you don't have to keep trying to grab for something. Right. And so it's the, the grabbing is the biggest thing. Uh, I write in the book a little bit about Julia Cameron's morning pages. Most people don't really understand how they work. You're not supposed to get up and write three pages of good prose. You're not supposed to write a, get up and write three pages of interesting things. 
You're simply supposed to get up and write three pages, period. About anything, junk, garbage, cruft, get it off your chest, doesn't matter. Just put it down. Because as soon as you do, for the rest of the day, if you try to bring it up again, your subconscious says, ah, I already wrote that down. I don't need to revisit that. It's taken care of. I wrote it down. I've discharged that. And so part of what it means to have a practice is the practice defines who you are. If you want to be a runner, the best thing to do is go run every day. If you run every day for 30 days, you're a runner. You don't have to subscribe to Runner's World. You don't have to have fancy equipment. You just have to run every day. If you want to be a writer, you have to write every day. And you don't have to show it to anybody. You simply have to do it. And not showing it to people lets you off the hook at some level, but at least you can see yourself as that kind of person. And then the step after that, which I'm a huge fan of, and the internet makes this easier than ever, is publish it anonymously. I think you should have a daily blog, but don't put your name on it. And after you've written 30 or 40 entries of your daily blog or made five or six episodes of your podcast, you're going to want to put your name on it. And then you can, but begin with, and if your name's not on it, it's so delicious because there's no upside and there's no downside. So you're simply doing it. And that's all you're going to get out of it is that you did it. Yeah. I want to ask you about money for a second, because I think it's a topic that a lot of creatives uh, shy mm -hmm. away from. And I think this will actually be, might be the, some of the most powerful stuff people hear is around the topic of money. You've been financially successful. You launched a business 30 years ago that you sold and exited. You've had you know, many hits in your books and businesses. You've made money as a creative. It's sure. fair to say that. Um, how can... What should creators be thinking about in terms of what if they want to create great work, but also they want to be rich. They want to make millions. They want to, for the heck of it, to support their family, their lifestyle. They want to make money. Yeah. What should they be thinking about in terms of art and money and marrying the both without it feeling bad or icky or ah, I'm selling myself in a bad way to make money? How can they approach it mentally so that it doesn't, cripple them, but they achieve the results they want. I, I th my answer might surprise some people, but here we go. The odds that you will make a lot of money doing exactly what you want are zero to a rounding error, zero. <laughs> it is possible to make a lot of money. It is easier now for people of privilege to do it than most any other time in history because of the network effect, because of the power of software, because of tools that give you uh, reach to millions of people. The way you make a lot of money is you figure out what people with money want to spend that money on to solve their problem now. And you go solve that problem. And then over time, you amplify their need and you let them do it again. That is how everybody, with few exceptions, who has made a lot of money has done it. Those people don't get to say, oh, but I also have this idea and I need to express it because I think it's generous. Those are different things. And only in the last hundred years has it even been conceivable that you could get paid money to do what you love. This is brand new idea. Mm -hmm. So I am in favor of doing what you love and charging for it if you can, because it holds you responsible, puts you on the hook, creating tension, serving people you want to serve, and maybe you'll get paid a little bit. But if you want to make a lot of money, listen to the market and show up to the market with something the market wants to buy. Because you don't get to insist that the market is wrong when you're asking the market to pay you something. Do it without commentary. Do it without drama. Simply show up and do the thing. Focus on the practice, not hoping and wishing for the outcome that you need to be reassured by, but the practice, the best you can do it. Because if you what could be better than the best you could do it? Nothing.